is Robin Coleman, and I serve as chair of the Department of Communication Studies. On behalf of the department, I would offer you my warmest welcome. I'm hearing feedback. Can you hear that? Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds okay. Yeah. Uh, in 1974, our department entered into an intellectually rewarding partnership with Howard R. Marsh, a UM alumnus and former Michigan journalist. Thanks to his generous bequest, the Howard R. Marsh Center for the Study of Journalistic Performance was born. I think he dropped out. Yeah. But keep, yeah. Just keep talking. Well, just, I, I will keep talking. I've got it covered. Um, the Marsh Center supports scholarly research on democratic functions of news media. Through this world-class center, we also have the Marsh Postdoctoral Fellowship and the Marsh Distinguished Research Fellow. The Marsh Endowment is truly the gift that sustains. In 1994, the Marsh Visiting Professorship in Journalism was added. The this Marsh Visiting Professor is an eminent professional journalist. Through classroom teaching, the Marsh Professor educates UM students on the media's ability to perform their functions in a democratic society. I am thrilled that Louisa Lim is this year's Marsh Visiting Professor. It's back. Louisa is most certainly an eminent professional journalist. She spent a decade in China reporting for NPR and the BBC. For her reporting, she earned a Peabody, an Alfred DuPont Columbia University Silver Baton, two Edward R. Morrow Awards, and a number of Human Rights Press Awards. After leaving China, she was named a Knight Wallace Fellow right here at the University of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> In 2014, Louisa published her book, The People's Republic of Amnesia, Tiananmen Revisited, with Oxford University Press. The book was correctly described by the LA Review of Books as stunning and important. The Financial Times also got it right, describing Louisa's book as outstanding. It is no surprise then that the People's Republic of Amnesia was named an Economist Book of the Year. Louisa has spoken widely about her book to include at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Committee to Protect Journalists, the National Press Club, and the Association for Asian Studies Conference. She's even appeared on the Colbert Report. <laughs> Louisa is also an expert educator and scholar. She is contributing editor for the journal Media, Culture, and Society. This summer, she will join the faculty at the University of Melbourne, where she will teach journalism and develop a master's program in international journalism. To close, I'd like to put a finer point on the importance of Louisa's work. <clears throat> Last month, Louisa delivered remarks at the ceremony for the Lewis Lyons Award for Courage and Integrity in Journalism at Harvard. The recipient of the prize, Chinese journalist Yang Jixin, was forbidden from leaving China to accept his award. It was Louisa who was tapped to give the keynote address on his behalf. Today, she will present the very timely Marsh Center lecture China's War on Information, in which she explores China's increasing attempts to censor and control information, especially in cyberspace. And before we give our round of applause welcoming Louisa, I would just like to present her with this small token of my deep appreciation for you oh, this you year. So Please welcome Louisa. <laughs> So thank you so much, Robin, for that uh, introduction. And thank you to the Marsh family for funding this fantastic post. And before I start, I'd also like to thank Robin Nolan for doing all the organization and everyone else in the department, including Cheryl Erdman, Linda Kreuter, Patty Scannell, all my colleagues who are here today uh, for supporting me and listening to my complaints 
and giving me solutions over the past couple of years. And also a shout out to the Knight Wallace Fellows. Thank you for coming. <laughs> So today I'm going to talk about uh, the media strategy of the Chinese leader Xi Jinping, who came to power in November 2012. Um, uh, nicknamed by the media, the chairman of everything. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about his vision of the role of the media and how that's playing out. I'm going to ground my discussion of his media policy in a speech that he made on February the 19th this year, a landmark speech which uh, was called a turning point in uh, Communist Party media policy. So this is really going to be a primer on how the chairman of everything has intensified control on the media and has innovated censorship for the digital era. And I'm going to start with a story. So just before he came to uh, the top post in November 2012, I was working in China um, for NPR. I was their China correspondent. I'd been there about a decade, and I'd worked for the BBC beforehand. And I, we wanted to do some, a story trying to give some idea of what Xi Jinping was like as a person. So we decided to go back to his early years. And uh, I decided to go to a place called Liangjiahe in Shanxi province. And this is Liangjiahe in Shanxi province. So he was sent there during the Cultural Revolution at the age of 15. And it's in northwest China, with uh, an area with yellow lowest soil, where people live in these caves scooped out of the hillside. And the cave on the right-hand side is the one that he lived in for seven years from the age of 15. So we want, I wanted to go there and find out, just get some anecdotes from people about what he was like and what his life was there, like when he lived there, because apparently he spent seven years digging methane pits with villagers. Um, so we decided to make this trip, and uh, just before I was about to go, I heard from another journalist who'd just come back from there, and she said, oh, it's really hard to go there. Uh, the police have put checkpoints at the at the village, uh, at the entrance to the village, so journalists can't get in or out. Now, if you're a foreign journalist in China, this kind of thing is quite normal, uh, because uh, the authorities, they don't censor you, but they, access, uh, they limit your access to sources. And they do that sometimes by making the sources inaccessible. For example, putting police or officials to stop you uh, gaining access to the village. But having been in China a long time, this is kind of par for the course. So uh, I decided to do what we normally do in that circumstance, which is to time the visit for either breakfast or dinner when the police are normally eating. So um, that was the plan. Things did not go according to plan. Unfortunately, we got lost on the way. And by the time that we got to the village, it was dusk. And we, uh, there, was, um, there weren't any police there, but there weren't any people either, because everybody was at home eating. So we wandered around, we bumped into a couple of people, they were really tight-lipped. Nobody wanted to say anything. It was clear that some kind of order had been given. And then suddenly, night fell like a curtain. It was pitch black, couldn't see anything. And there was one single light shining out of a cave, kind of halfway up the hillside. So we stumbled up to that cave, and there we met this man. Uh, so we started talking to him, and um, we discovered very quickly that he was absolutely, utterly deaf. Couldn't hear a word that we said. <laughs> um, so normally, this would be a kind of a, an impediment to interviewing, but we were in kind of a difficult situation. So we started writing questions down on pieces of paper and holding them up to him. And it turned out that he was a really interesting guy. He was 84 years old. His name was Xie Yubin. He'd known Xi Jinping when he lived in the village, and he'd really, you know, he'd liked him. He said he was a nice young man. He liked reading. He was close to the people. You know, all the kind of things that we thought that he would say. And then he told another story. He, he, he described how he himself had been in the army as a young man, and not only had he known Xi Jinping, he'd known Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongxun, who was a famous revolutionary. And he'd been a messenger, so he'd taken messages to Xi Zhongxun. And he said what Xi Jinping liked most of all was to come and talk to him and hear Xie Yubin's reminiscences of his father. 
And then he told us some other stories as well. He told us how after Xi Jinping became a, uh, a part, after he rose up in the hierarchy, he came back uh, on a trip to the village and he bought presents for the villagers. Uh, he bought an alarm clock for every household because he knew that if you live in a cave, it's really dark. And so the children were always oversleeping and they were never getting to school on time. So he bought alarm clocks and gave them out to everybody. But to Xie Yubin, he gave money, although Xie Yubin wasn't there at the time. So he missed him, but he got money. So we were quite pleased. You know, this, journalistically, this was more of a result than we'd kind of been hoping for. So after we finished talking to him, we went back to find our driver. And when we found him, he was just in a terrible state. He was almost hysterical. He said, where have you been? Um, you know, I've had terrible problems. And it turned out that the, some village officials had found him and had told him that foreign journalists were not allowed in the village, that nobody would speak to us, and that if he stayed any longer, his car would be impounded, and he would be detained, and we would all be detained, and there would be huge trouble. So we immediately got in the car and drove off. And just when we were, as we were leaving, we suddenly realized just what a stroke of luck we'd had. Just by sheer dumb luck, we had stumbled on the only person in the entire village who had literally heard, not heard the order not to talk. <laughs> Everybody else had been warned, do not talk to the foreign media, otherwise you'll get in trouble. But of course, Xie Yubin hadn't heard. <laughs> So to me, this was kind of a darkly symbolic moment. I mean, at the time, we thought that we were used to cycles of repression and loosening. And we thought that this was a cycle of repression that would loosen up after Xi Jinping came to power. But actually, that's not what happened. After he came to power, that cycle of repression continued. But for me, this was really a, it was a harbinger of, of things to come. So I would like to uh, just set the context. The role of the media in China is not the same as in the West. Uh, the most important function of the news media is to be the ears, the eyes, the throat, and the tongue for the party and the people. Now, this might sound like something that comes from the Maoist era of the 40s, but it isn't. This comes from 2013 from a textbook that all of China's journalists need to study in order to pass an exam to get a license. So uh, the role of the media in China is basically to serve the party. And note the primacy of the party over the people in that statement. So I'm going to talk about this very important day, uh, mentioned in hyperbolic terms in the state-run media as an important day that all people in the media will remember. This was the day that Xi Jinping toured three newsrooms, and here he is at the People's Daily, uh, enjoying almost North Korean levels of adulation. Um, and this was the day that he delivered his uh, policy on the media, this 48-character guiding policy on the media. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about it for that long. But uh, I think the most important thing to note in this is uh, that the, the, the very first thing that is mentioned as the mission and responsibility of the public party's news and public opinion work is to raise high the banner of Marxism-Leninism. In short, and Xi Jinping summed it up himself, all the work by the party's media must reflect the party's will, safeguard the party's authority, and safeguard the party's unity. So basically, the media's job is to keep the party in power. This picture is from that same day, uh, and it was quite famous uh, on the Chinese internet because of the slogan uh, this was taken at CCTV, and the slogan on the poster in the back says, uh, CCTV's surname is the party. We pledge absolute loyalty. We are ready for your inspection. So what has Xi Jinping done when it comes to, the, uh, to control of the media since he took over? This is just a, a quick rundown of some of the most important uh, legislation 
and regulations that have been introduced since he came to power. Uh, the first one is anti-rumour legislation. So if a social media post has been viewed 5,000 times or retweeted more than 500 times, the person who posted it can be tried for defamation. It criminal, uh, has criminal liability and could face up to three years in prison. Um, so that's the second one. The first one we already spoke about was on-the-job training, which requires a quarter of a million Chinese journalists to study 18 hours of socialism with Chinese characteristics and Marxist journalism, Marxist news values. Uh, the third uh, law that is up there uh, is very interesting because it gives news organizations the legal responsibility for supervising their employees, their journalists' blogs, and their microblogs. It also uh, means that journalists are legally forbidden from releasing information from interviews on social media if their employers haven't approved that. Journalists, Chinese journalists, are also forbidden from sharing information that they got while out on a job with foreign media, and they're forbidden from using blogs and social media to disclose information obtained through personal con conduct. If they break these rules, they can lose their journalist certificates or they could be referred to the judiciary. So the next three laws from 2015, uh, a trio of very important laws, and these laws uh, define national security very, very widely indeed. So according to the kind of definitions that have been circulating, national security includes politics, finance, the environment, food safety, religion, and culture. So this has a very chilling effect on freedom of speech. Uh, the last two laws up there are draft legislation that has only just uh, been publicized and no one really knows how it will work. Uh, the first one, according to the first one, it, it says foreign companies in China sh uh, are barred from publishing online content without government approval. The second one says foreign companies in China must transfer their domain names to Chinese domain names, which would, of course, mean they're subject to Chinese censorship. So these would effectively reduce China's internet to an intranet but no one is exactly sure how these could possibly be implemented. So you, if you're working as a journalist in China, censorship, as a Chinese journalist, uh, censorship is really part of everyday life. Uh, Chinese news organizations get uh, lists of directives every day telling them what subjects they cannot cover. And I mean, all of the topics that we know to be sensitive topics uh, are taken for granted, but extra directives are added from time to time. So just to give you an example of the scope of those, directi those directives, uh, we've just had the parliamentary sessions in Beijing in, in March, and at this moment, uh, someone leaked the censorship, censorship directives, and the media was given specific instructions they weren't, the topics they were not to write about included uh, delegates wearing badges with Xi Jinping's picture on it, uh, the nationality of delegates, they were not to make jokes about delegates' proposals, um, other subjects that were banned included uh, the social problem of scalpers selling hospital appointments with doctors, um, air pollution, Taiwan, North Korea, the property market, the stock market, foreign exchange, and stories about economic topics that depict anything other than steady economic growth. So you can see that it's actually quite difficult to know what you are allowed to write about when there are so many directives. Um, and the lines are very unclear. Even for the foreign me media, the lines are very unclear. So this is uh, an example that happened to me. When I was writing my book about Tiananmen and its legacy, I, as an experiment, I took this picture, the picture of Tank Man, which is so iconic in the West, the young man um, 
standing in the line of the path of tanks uh, in June 1989. And I took it to four Beijing universities. And I just wanted to know how many students um, at those universities could identify this picture. And I had been thinking that even though the internet is heavily censored, at Beijing's top universities, young students are really, really technically savvy. They know how to get around these blocks if they wanted to do so. So I was interested to find out how many of them could identify this picture. I was surprised to find out of 100 students, only 15 knew what it was. And I could tell that the other 85 weren't lying because they asked me questions. They said, is it, is it South Korea? Is it Kosovo? 19 students asked me if it was a military parade. That is more than the number of students who uh, actually knew what it was. So when I was doing this experiment, I was quite nervous. Even though I had a journalist card that gave me license to ask these questions, I was quite nervous about being detained. And I realized that I myself had internalized uh, some, of the, some of the censorship um, and the, the, that is so pervasive. But I was not detained. But the interesting thing was, a year later, in the run-up to the, an the 25th anniversary of June the 4th, um, a French camera crew, ex they repeated the same experiment. So there were some differences. I had been by myself doing it for radio on a university campus. This was a crew of three people. It was a year later, and they were on a busy shopping street. But they were on the street asking people questions for 10 minutes before they were detained. And they were detained for six hours over two days. And they were warned that um, their visas were in danger, that they might be sent back, that they might be expelled, that this kind of behavior was completely unacceptable. So I think this is a very good example of how the lines are so unclear. You know, a topic which is fine one year becomes completely uh, impossible the next. Parts of the country which you can travel to freely suddenly become shut down. And there are whole swathes of the country, like Tibet and Xinjiang, that are shut down, shut off to outsiders for years on end. And nobody ever tells you that you've crossed the line until it's too late. So ambiguity breeds fear, fear breeds self-censorship. And in recent years, foreign journalists have had visas denied. They've been expelled. Three quarters said their reporting had been hindered. 25% said their sources faced reprisals. And a fifth of foreign correspondents in China said they'd been subject to pressure overseas with embassy officials complaining to their employers. But of course, for Chinese journalists, the situation is far worse. China's is the biggest jailer of journalists worldwide, with a quarter of 199 jailed journalists in Chinese prisons. It is uh, 176 out of 180 in the World Press Freedom Index. So around the time of Xi's visit to uh, all these um, newsrooms, this, this appeared in the China Daily, and it explicitly linked the media's job with China's economic slowdown. It said, it is necessary for the media to restore people's trust in the party, especially as the economy has entered a new normal, and suggestions that it is declining and dragging down the global economy have occurred. Now, this came after something which was really a, real low point for the media, both the Chinese media and the foreign media in China. And that was this moment in August 2015, when China's stock market was doing very badly. It was plummeting every day. And uh, amidst this, a, a business journalist called Wang Xiaolu appeared on television, uh, confessing to sensational reporting. Uh, he said that he had obtained information through irregular channels. And in his confession, he said, during a sensitive period, I should not have published a report which had such a negative impact. So this was a, a really 
a scary moment for much of the Chinese media because, uh, you know, until then, there had been quite a lot of good financial reporting that had gone on. Um, and, but this was just one of a number of, uh, a period of confessions, forced confessions, without trial, without legal representation, on state-run television. And a lot of those uh, were designed to send specific messages uh, about the use of information. So we also saw a Chinese journalist who confessed to stealing state, state secrets. We, we saw uh, confessing on, on state-run television. We saw a confession from a famous blogger who'd been very outspoken, who confessed to soliciting prostitutes. And then uh, this year, we saw five Hong Kong booksellers uh, appearing, making various confessions on television. This man, Gui Min Hai, was actually a Swedish citizen who disappeared from Thailand. Uh, all five of them had been working for a publishing house that put out kind of gossipy, uh, gossipy books about the Chinese leadership. Um, but he ap appeared, uh, disappeared from Thailand and appeared in China on state-run television, confessing to having killed someone by mistake in a drunk driving accident 12 years before. It's just a little bit fishy. So we are seeing these strategies to control legacy media, censorship, intimidation, diplomatic pressure, and most recently, uh, forced confessions and even illegal rendition. But new tools are needed to control the much more unruly sphere of cyberspace, uh, which has been called the priority of priorities. Uh, in Xi Jinping's words, he has spoken about the necessity of ensuring a clear and bright online space. So that's almost giving um, an ideological basis for the necessity of online censorship. Uh, and in order to do uh, that, the Chinese have um, developed this system, which is nicknamed the Great Firewall in the, pre in the West. It's a, a program of selective, sen selective censorship, which is unprecedented in recorded world history, according to Gary King at Harvard. So China has uh, more than 688 million internet users. It's a, a figure that has doubled since 2008. So you can see how this is a relatively recent uh, problem for the Chinese government, and now has come um, comes the time for my listicle of nine things that are banned in Chinese cyberspace. Now, I just wanted to give you an idea of the kind of um, specificity, the scope and the specificity of, the, of Chinese censorship. So there are various different ways of censoring things online. Uh, posts can be made private, so you don't know that nobody else is seeing it. They can be deleted. Your entire account can be deleted, or the blogger could be detained or arrested. So there are different levels um, of censorship. But recent academic studies estimate that between 13 and 16 percent of things posted are on Weibo, China's Twitter, are censored. So I'm just going to give you a few uh, random examples of things that are censored on Chinese internet. China's internet. Number one, strange but true, golden inflatable toads. They're not allowed to be shown on the internet. Um, this was uh, a park in Beijing, Yuan Town Park. They uh, decided to get an inflatable toad to get tourists to come and visit. But unfortunately, uh, inflate a toad has another meaning online in China. And it's a function of Chinese censorship that Chinese internet users find these very humorous, very sarcastic ways to talk about subjects that they're not allowed to talk about. So on the Chinese internet, toad refers to Jiang Zemin, China's for former, the former Communist Party Secretary General who came to power after Tiananmen. Um, and uh, since the 2011, actually, the word toad has been a word that you can't search for on Weibo or on China's Twitter. Um, and 
Other words that use toad are also banned. For example, people, uh, the word toad fans refers to people who are nostalgic for Jiang Zemin's era, which only in retrospect is seen to be relatively liberal. So toad fans is a banned word. Um, another example, the law, fa lu. Uh, this word was banned in December 2015. That was during the trial of a famous civil rights lawyer called Pu Chang, and people were tweeting about his trial a lot uh, on Weibo. So other words that you couldn't search for on Weibo included judge, prosecutor, judgment, and trial. So now just to bring the conversation down a little, this song was banned in 2015. It is called The Fart Song. I'm going to play a little bit for you So this was actually completely removed from the internet in August 2015. It was one of 120 songs that were deemed harmful to public morality because of their obscenity, violence, insubordination, or immorality. It's by um, a Taiwanese pop star called Dang Zhiye, and it's basically poking fun at sort of sycophantic office workers who suck up to their bosses and who think money is really important. So that was banned. So moving quickly on. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, this is uh, a yogurt drink uh, called Da Hun Jun, which, um, and this was not just banned from the internet, it was actually removed from uh, shelves of Chinese supermarkets in January 2015 and banned from social media. Sorry, the sound doesn't sound that good. Um, so this is supposed to be drunk with roasted meat. Uh, and so the name in Chinese, it means great meat monarch. So it doesn't translate particularly well. But unfortunately, it's a homophone. Um, so in, uh, there's another, the, the same tones, the same word, also means fatuous and self-indulgent leader. And that's the reason that that was banned. Um, a more recent example is the Panama Papers. Uh, the, this was clearly, uh, this was the censorship instruction uh, for the removal of all information about the Panama Papers. And that's because at least uh, eight of China's current or former senior officials had families that are used the services of Mossack Fonseca, which had actually also given um, workshops to Chinese government departments. Uh, so in uh, November 2014, puns and wordplay were banned from China's internet. Uh, the official reason for the ban was uh, that they might cause cultural and linguistic chaos. Sorry about the sound. OK. Certain numbers are banned at certain moments. So to talk about uh, what happened on June the 4th in uh, China, you use the word 64, liu si. So 64 and 89 for 1989 have become sensitive numbers in China. So they have been banned. Uh, around the anniversary, you can't uh, search for these numbers, and, and people found other ways to talk about uh, June the 4th. So instead of saying June the 4th or 64, they would say 8 squared. So 8 squared was banned. So people would say that year that was banned, that day, uh, today was banned, tomorrow was banned, uh, <laughs> when spring turns to summer was banned, uh, then even the word sensitive word became a sensitive word. 
And then last year, uh, certain monetary transactions, if they were made using apps, they also could not go through because of the censorship restrictions. So if you tried to transfer any sum of money with either 64 or 89 in it, you might find that you had trouble. So another musical interlude, and I'm very sad that you probably won't be able to hear it because this is a, a very particularly interesting piece of music. It is the theme song for China's internet censors. <laughs> So the problem with this uh, piece of music was uh, the phrase Wang Luo Tiang Guo, which means internet superpower, but it's also a homophone. The word Tiang can mean super, but it can also mean walls. So on, on the internet, everyone laughed at the internet censors for singing a song about internet walls or censorship. Um, which was not what they intended. So suddenly overnight, this song disappeared from the Chinese internet. It seemed like a kind of meta act of karmic retribution that Chinese internet censors ended up censoring themselves, apparently. And my last thing in my listicle is Pooh Bear. I promised to tell you why Pooh Bear was, uh, was banned on the Chinese internet. And this was actually the most, vi sorry, uh, the most banned viral post of 2015 was this. It might look relatively inoffensive to you, but this was the post that was posted more and deleted faster than anything else. Um, the reason for that is that Winnie the Pooh has long been used as a way that the Chinese internet users refer to Xi Jinping. And actually, when Xi Jinping met Obama, uh, China's internet users put up pictures of Pooh and Tigger, with Obama being Tigger. But this picture was particularly sensitive uh, because it was used to depict <laughs> Xi Jinping at the military parade for the 70th anniversary of the founding of China's Communist Party. Uh, so it's clear that uh, the internet censors don't really like the leader of the country being compared to a bear of very little brain. Uh, as George Orwell said, every joke is a tiny revolution and China's internet censors apparently do not have a great sense of humor. So, I mean, apart from that, uh, Xi Jinping has advocated the need for propaganda to extend its tentacles. He's talked about uh, the huge uh, changes that the media is undergoing, how digital disruption uh, is changing the media, and what needs to be done in order to counter that. And we have seen a lot of innovation in censorship that has been really, really interesting. So there are examples that probably people know about, the fake commentators. So th this is the 50 cent party. So these are people who are paid to post comments that are, uh, that are supporting government policy or attacking people who are outspoken. And these are the actual words um, of one directive. It was. Uh, the kind of comments that people had to make uh, for the trial of Pu the Chang, human, the human rights uh, lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is really an attempt to influence the social media environment within China by, uh, by ensuring that there are lots of comments that are uh, supportive of government policy. And I should say that Blake Miller at the IRS is doing some really, really fascinating research on this, and anyone who's interested should uh, read his paper, or his draft paper. Um, so we're also seeing 
efforts to influence the social media environment overseas, and not just in Chinese, but in English as well. And this was a really interesting case. Uh, suddenly, we saw all these Twitter accounts uh, popping up, and they, were all, they all had very generic Western names. The pictures in the status photos, they were extremely good looking, often partly clad. And strangely, they only like to tweet Chinese propaganda, often stories uh, from Xinhua about Tibet saying how happy Tibetans were living under Chinese rule. So it turned out that these were shell accounts. The pictures had been stolen. Uh, the man up there known as Tom Hugo is actually a famous Brazilian male model. <laughs> and Twitter shut down these accounts. Um, a very recent uh, innovation is this Facebook swarm, and we've really only seen this once that we know of. It was in January this year, the new Taiwanese president, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, suddenly found that thousands of Chinese internet users were somehow evading the Great Firewall and were posting these messages on her Facebook wall in this coordinated attack. Um, and they were messages uh, countering against Taiwanese independence, but they were often rote messages saying things like, honor to those who love the motherland, shame on those who harm the motherland. And these uh, were organized, uh, I mean, it was clear that they were organized and it, it was organized by a group that went public and explained exactly how they'd done it and why they'd done it. Um, another censorship innovation was the great canon. Uh, and this uh, happened last summer for, uh, and it's really the first time that we've seen something like this. It's this new tool of censorship which really turns internet users into weapons of cyber war. It, internet, it intercepts traffic sent to Chinese, Baidu, a Chinese search engine, and injects code into the computer, so programming your browser to attack certain sites, and the sites that were attacked over these, this two-week period were sites that offer Chinese people ways of circumventing Chinese censorship. So we've only seen that in use once uh, for a two-week period. So these are all uh, ways of influencing the external media environment. And this was a particularly interesting one. This happened while I was working in China. Uh, so once a year, during the parliamentary sessions, it's the only time that uh, foreign journalists in China actually get to go to press conferences and get to ask questions. Um, and it's quite difficult to get picked to ask a question. If they know that you're going to ask a hard question, they never pick you. So in 10 years, I was never allowed to ask a single question. Um, but in 2012, it was really interesting because there was one woman, you can see her with her hand up there, who was asked at four separate press conferences. She was chosen to ask questions. She spoke beautiful Chinese. She asked very, very softball questions. Um, and the really odd thing was that nobody in the foreign media court recognized her. Uh, the same thing happened the next year with this, this young woman, Louise Kenny. It turns out they both worked for uh, a company called Global CAMG, headquartered in Melbourne, majority owned by China Radio International. So they were, the, by having people like this, it gave the impression of transparency and openness, but it was a charade. It was also part of this network of covered radio stations that majority owned by China Radio International, including 15 radio stations in the US, which is actually against uh, US law. So Reuters did a really good report about this last year, and since then, um, the FCC and the Justice Department has opened an investigation into how this was possible. But these are all radio stations around the world that are broadcasting in local languages, but running Chinese propaganda. And it is part of a broader push to increase China's uh, voice overseas. <coughs> As you can see in his speech in February this year, 
uh, Xi Jinping talked about the necessity for strengthening the international communication capacity and focusing the proper telling of China's story. And China is willing to spend a lot of money on this. Uh, in 2009 alone, they budgeted $7 billion to increase China's global media presence. So we saw uh, CCTV, the state-run uh, TV company, uh, opening new hubs in Africa and America. And in fact, in the five years since 2011, it has increased its staff tenfold. Now it has more than 70 bureaus worldwide. It broadcasts in 100 to 171 countries in six languages. Uh, and China's mouthpiece newspaper, the China Daily as well, now is printed in six different editions around the world <laughs> and is often given out for free. And when you put this in an environment where legacy media outlets elsewhere are struggling and are strapped for cash, you can see how it's changing the external media uh, environment. We're also seeing a pattern of media acquisitions, of uh, buying up media companies overseas. I mean, particularly Chinese language newspapers, but the biggest uh, fish that, um, that was brought up recently was the South China Morning Post, a Hong Kong newspaper, which, is, which in the past has had quite critical reporting on, uh, on China. And it was bought by Alibaba, a Chinese company, in, in the past year. And the stated aim was to have more <coughs> objective news reports about China. Objective really meaning pro-government. But interestingly, since they bought it, uh, just in the last few weeks, they've taken off the paywall so anyone around the world can, can read it for free. So we're really seeing moves being made to control the narrative, not just in Chinese and not just in China, but around the world for audiences in their own languages. <coughs> So when it comes to innovation, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, sounding a little bit like a tech mogul, said, we must accommodate the trends of segmentation and differentiation, accelerating the building of a new pattern of public opinion channeling. And we are seeing moves also, uh, moves that we've seen, I mean, we've seen these in the past, but it, I think that it's becoming uh, quite, uh, we're seeing more attempts to uh, influence uh, culture and cultural events around the world. Uh, so one example was an uh, art ex exhibition in Bangladesh last year. And it ran this exhibit, which was called Last Words. And it was the framed pictures of the last statements made by five Tibetans who uh, self-immolated. So they set fire to themselves as a political protest against Chinese control. Well, the Chinese ambassador toured this exhibition, and he really, really didn't like this exhibit. And um, this is what happened to it after he'd been round. So uh, bear in mind that in developing countries, China is investing a lot of money. It's offering loans at preferential prices. It's helping with infrastructure and development. And it is willing to use these as it will. Um, we've seen over the years many, many examples of Chinese interference in cultural affairs. This is just a very short list. Uh, whether it be uh, stopping dissident authors from attending book fairs or trying to get film festivals not to run films that the Chinese government does not like, so often about Tibet or Xinjiang. Um, the last three on my list uh, was a scandal about a hot air balloon, uh, which had a Tibetan flag on it. And China actually uh, filed diplomatic protests in three different European countries to try to stop the hot air balloon from attending a hot air balloon, hot air balloon festivals. Um, the picture at the top uh, is uh, a picture which some of you may possibly um, no, it comes from Adam Sandler's latest film, Pixels. 
Uh, so the plot of the film is that intergalactic aliens um, attack some of the world's most important historical sites, the Washington Monument, the Taj Mahal, things like this. In the original script in 2013, the intergalactic aliens also attacked the Great Wall of China. But this was uh, disappeared from the final film. It did not happen. And that was because the Sony, Sony executives were worried that if the Great Wall of China was attacked by aliens, then the film might not be released in China. So this is, a, I mean, it's an example of self-censorship. Uh, and then we're seeing this as well, where in film and entertainment, where the lure of the Chinese market is such that uh, Western companies will do whatever they can in order to ensure that their products are reaching those 1.4 billion consumers. And I think that this is where um, we need to think about possible causes for concern in the future. Now we're moving into this age of distributed content where power is shifting from news organizations to platforms. And those platforms are owned by tech companies that may not share the same commitment to freedom of expression as news organizations do. And so I think we have to be mindful of the possible consequences. And we, there have already been some cases uh, which have been very, very worrying. Um, the first was in 2005 when a Chinese journalist emailed some censorship instructions about coverage of the anniversary of 1989. And he uh, was put on trial for leaking state secrets. He spent eight years in prison. Uh, the evidence came from Yahoo, who handed over, his e handed over his emails after a Chinese request. It's not the only case that has been like that. Uh, this, in 2012, was the case of a Chinese poet called Zhu Yufu. And he wrote this poem called The Square. Uh, you can see it up there. It's time, people of China, it's time. The square belongs to everyone. With your own two feet, it's time to head to the square and make your choice. So for this poem, he was uh, sentenced to seven years in prison for inciting subversion. I think the interesting thing about this poem was that he didn't, um, he didn't post it on a microblog or put it anywhere online. He simply used the Chinese version of Skype, which is a joint venture between Skype and a Hong Kong company. And he used that to send it to a friend. And that was seen as an act of subversion. And then an example from 2014, LinkedIn, which many of you probably use, uh, censored content about uh, the, the anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown. And in their justification, they explicitly linked the need to create value for our members in China around, and around the world. And they said that's why they needed to implement the Chinese government's restrictions on content when and to the extent required. So I think many people are also watching quite nervously because at the moment, Facebook is banned in China. But Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, has been, on, uh, has been wooing China quite intensively. He learned Mandarin. He met Xi Jinping. He's rumored to have asked Xi Jinping to even give his child, his baby daughter, a Chinese name. And this picture here shows uh, the moment when he was visited in his office by China's internet regulator, Liu Wei, the chief censor in China. And sitting on Mark Zuckerberg's desk, what was his reading matter? Xi Jinping's governance of China. So I think the questions that we need to think about are in this age of distributed content where digital algorithms are controlling what we see, what could the possible impact be? If you think to the Facebook swarm, could we see thousands of internet users being mobilized to remove information uh, that the Chinese government does not want people outside China to see? What price will technology companies pay for access to the Chinese market? So these questions come at a, at a time when the assault on freedom of information in China is of a magnitude not seen in decades. There has been some pushback from the state-run media in China. Recently, we even saw hidden newspaper headlines. This is a really interesting case. The top story is about media, the media and the party. 
The bottom story is about sea burials in China. And if you read the headlines from top to bottom, uh, the hidden message says something like, the souls of the Chinese media have died because they bear the party's name. Uh, another, news, another magazine was censored and wrote a story about it, uh, which is very unusual. Uh, on the same day that they wrote that story, uh, this photo gallery appeared on their website. There is no mistaking the, ma the message. So just to conclude, journalism is facing an existential crisis in today's China. The chairman of everything is stamping his control upon the media. His strategy has been described by uh, David Bandersky, a Hong Kong scholar of the media, as all dimensional control in all media, on all platforms, in all fields, ex internally and externally, also aiming at entertainment China, uh, entertainment culture and advertising. So China's media strategy has become outwards facing, the proper telling of China's story around the world at whatever cost, using whatever means necessary. And I think that we overseas, we do also have a role. We should be vigilant in tracking the censorship innovations, in monitoring them, in reporting them, and in counter and countering them with the sunlight of transparency. Thank you. There's no doubt, at least a little doubt, that press freedom has uh, tightened up so far during the first term of Xi Jinping. My question is, as he enters his next term, next year, what do you think is going to happen? Status quo? Even further tightening? Softening? More importantly, <coughs> what do you think are the elements that will give your prediction credence? Well, I mean, the things that I talked about today are things that are already happening. They're not, for the most part, predictions apart from um, right at the very end. Uh, I think we see, if I knew what Xi Jinping would do in his next five-year term, I would probably be far richer than I am now. But I mean, we are seeing no signs that indicate any possible loosening um, all the trends seem to indicate further tightening of control, and it's difficult to know uh, uh, what could happen that would change that at this stage. I mean, I think one thing that Xi Jinping's term in office has shown us is really how little we know about the Chinese leadership. You know, before he came to power, there was all of this, uh, you know, there was all of this questioning about what kind of person he would be, whether he would be a closet reformer. And that was where the speculation was focused. Very few people call, it, call him for what he was. Very few people in government, in academia, in journalism, in any sphere uh, predicted that we would now be at, at this stage. So, you know, I think in all honesty, it, it's very difficult to see any type of loosening ahead. I was wondering what role you think government plays in this. Um, Forty years ago, if the Soviet news agency TASS had bought 15 American radio stations, the US government's response, I think, would have been fairly swift and firm. Similarly, Western governments regularly engaged in tit-for-tat negotiations about journalist visas. If Western journalists were expelled, some Soviet journalists would be expelled in return. So what has, has the Western game changed? Do you think Western governments need to step up? 
a little bit more in order to defend press freedoms and the rights of their news organizations to report in China? Um, yeah, I mean, this, is a, this has been a matter of sort of great, um, great discussion amongst Western journalists in China because, you know, in recent years, we've seen a number of Western journalists who've had visas uh, denied or who've been expelled. And it, in every case, the Western governments have not really responded in a very robust fashion. And it's interesting. I mean, there's a definite Chinese strategy as well to who gets expelled and who doesn't. In many cases, they will pick off journalists who have particular nationality and work for a news organization of another country. So like Melissa Chan from Al Jazeera, who worked for Al Jazeera, but was an American. And so the diplomatic focus is divided and it's harder for governments to lobby. But um, for journalists working in China, uh, there have been many, many calls for more reciprocity that uh, if a journalist from one country is expelled, then there's some kind of reciprocal treatment to Chinese journalists in that country. But the problem for Western governments is uh, freedom of expression in the West and freedom of the press is seen as something that you can't really trade away. <laughs> so it's very difficult for Western governments to take a, ro a more robust approach uh, without punishing Chinese journalists. And the problem isn't journalists, it's government policy. So this has been, I mean, as journalists in China, Western journalists in China, we've often called for a much more robust approach. And actually, the European approach ha has been more robust than the American approach. But it, it's kind of similar to what happened with human rights. Once human rights was hived off, and, but had its separate dialogue and was not part of the larger diplomatic dialogue, nobody cared anymore. And I think that um, it, it would be nice if there was, if governments would step up and really fight for freedom of information and to protect journalists. But we have not seen any signs that that will happen, and particularly with uh, the kind of Chinese investment that's flowing into these countries. I think that um, Western governments are nervous. They're nervous of uh, start, starting these kind of small battles that could flare up into something else. I'll try and make noise from back here. You can hear me, OK? So sitting over here, what it screams to me is weakness and fear. And I'm sure that in China, a certain amount of that comes across as well. And so it's increasing alienation from the government. So many campaigns have often got unexpected results. So I mean, jealous are. They circulate stuff and has precisely the opposite <coughs> result of what they're trying to do. Uh, would you agree that this is increasing alienation in China from the government? Because it's, uh, some of it is done undercover, but some of it is not. And they're very good at reading between the lines. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is problematic because I think it, the, the censorship, particularly over the internet, has reached such a stage that it is really alienating people who just want to use the internet, you know. So if you were someone who ran an online shop in Xinjiang after they had riots in Xinjiang, they just turned off the internet for 10 months and you just had to swallow your losses. If you were a scientist doing research in chemistry, after Liu Xiaobo won the Nobel Prize, suddenly you couldn't access the Nobel website. So you couldn't read up on the research done by Nobel laureates in, in chemistry and biology around the world. So, you know, I, I think because the internet is so central to our existence, I think all of these acts of in, internet censorship uh, do begin to uh, alienate normal people who just want to get on with their lives and earn money and, and do, do their own thing. So, so I, I definitely think that um, it, it, it is problematic for the government as well um, because people are not happy about not being able to you know, go online shopping in Xinjiang or whatever. So I think it is difficult. China with uh, what's been going on with Russia. Um, I mean, they, they, they 
teacher, I'm now learning some more from geography, uh, but in terms of uh, when trying to figure the expression the situation and Russia is also very bleak. Uh, so my first thought was the Jack, um, I mean the comparison with what Putin has been doing in Russia. And then what, where to go from here? Uh, do you see any sign, do you think that as the China's economy slows down, and this is, uh, the situation is going to get worse, or is there any hope that, as you mentioned, sometimes I mean they, they, they put governments put pressure and then they kind of let go a little bit? I mean, as regards Russia, I think governments around the world are watching China very carefully and they're learning lessons from China in terms of internet censorship and the kind of tools that could be available to them. I mean, in Russia as well, I think they have paid commentators and this kind of thing. And um, another country that has been watching China closely is Turkey, where they have banned, you know, one by one, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and really, you know, uh, studied, I think, the Chinese model to see how this could be done. Um, so I think China's sort of censorship <laughs> innovations are also being exported and that, you know, that is a matter of concern for us all. In terms of the future, I mean, all of the e economic indicators seem to suggest further economic slowdown. And for the Communist Party, the most important thing is maintaining stability. But any economic slowdown is likely to threaten stability because jobs will be lost and this kind of thing. So, uh, and given that we've seen these explicit linkages between the parties, uh, the media's role in restoring trust in the party and economic slowdown, I don't see, if there's economic slowdown, I don't see any way for a loosening of control over the media because then people would start reporting on stories that the government perhaps do, do not want people to write about, you know, jobs lost, uh, people struggling, corrupt officials, all of these things are not, not topics that, that the government wants people to read about because uh, it will affect social stability. So I don't see any prospect for loosening uh, it, in the foreseeable future. What are the implications of this Orwellian narrative you're presenting regarding media uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> foreign policy, in particular the seemingly aggressive stance China is taking in the South China Sea and uh, Japan and the U.S. Is um, <coughs> opposition to it? Mm, I mean, that's a really good question, and it's a very um, topical question because I think uh, what, you know, what we're seeing in the South China Sea is China very, very aggressively moving to, you know, actually construct islands. I think it was 3,000 acres of sand heaped up to make a man-made island. And in Europe, yeah and airstrips and this uh, installations, military installations. And I mean, it, you know, the state-run media is of course telling that story. You, you know, it's being used to tell that story and tell it quite aggressively um, overseas. And I think, um, all of the various arms of the state-run media are being mobilized around the world in, in this kind of campaign. So I think there are all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of implications for <laughs> foreign policy and implications not just in foreign relations but in other, other arenas as well. So recently we saw a case where uh, when they released, when the government released the statistics uh, the economic statistics, they actually censored some of the statistics that they normally release about foreign exchanges. So, you know, all of this kind of um, obscurity means that it's very difficult for people overseas to actually know what's going on because what is released, you don't necessarily know it's not the full story, it might not even be the story, and it is um, telling one story, but but there's so much that is, you know, being falsified in order to ensure the proper telling of China's story that I think it, 
it, it complicates matters immensely. Um, and I think the difference between then and now is that uh, in the past, it was relatively easy for the Chinese government to use this kind of top-down propaganda approach using the People's Daily and CCTV and their known mouthpieces. But now we're being deluged by messages from other sources, from comments, from Twitter, you know, from all these different arenas. And so it's much harder to kind of pick out uh, government interference in the message uh, and what's really going on. Oh, I think one last question. Two, two last <laughs> questions. Yes, Sylvia. Um, yeah, thank you. It was really insightful. Um, I was also really taken by your call upon all of us, you know, to intervene. And, um, you know, you brought up self-censorship, which is a big topic, and, you know, for anyone who does research in China, um, you know, this one home to me, I recently wrote an article together with a colleague who has been doing research in Taiwan for many years, and so, the paper, the article we wrote together was about both Taiwan and China and about, you know, people are passionate about uh, creativity, innovation, democratization efforts. And then they go, occurred to me once we had published the article, is this article going to get me in trouble, you know, for my next journey? Because look, for sure, you know, it's something that is always on our mind. And one of the things, you know, that I think you rightly point to is this call for us, you know, we need to expose some of these practices, both here at home, whatever home means, you know, and in, you know, across regions and how transnational corporations and governments are actually partnering in this. You brought up Facebook, right? And all of us using Facebook here very much so involved then in what's happening in part in China as well. And so for me, a big um, part of this though has also been to look towards alternatives, you know. So what else could we do um, that maybe not just critiques, yes, critique important, you know, but also points to efforts and, and endorses and may, and supports efforts that offer alternatives in China, try things out that challenge perhaps, you know, how things are done on the ground. So um, I wanted to hear, you know, do you have any of these stories of alternatives, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you know, whatever it is, efforts that challenge or, you know, provide spaces of alternatives, you know, no matter if that's expression or community formation or anything along those lines. I wish I did. I mean, I think, um, you know, in the past there have been lots of projects training Chinese journalists and things like that, and those have been really, really effective. But I think um, there's you know, given the fact that there's been this new law passed against uh, uh, governing, governing the uh, non-governmental organizations in China, I think it's also harder for um, outside groups or organizations to come in. And there's a, there's a great deal of, of fear as well about, could you get someone in China? Would you get someone in, so could you get someone in trouble? So, you know, it is really hard to think about things that can be done that are not completely sort of oppositional, but, but, but uh, uh, constructive. Um, and I would love to have any suggestions or ideas if you, if you can find any ways as well. And last question, yes. Okay, um, just kind of generalize all the ideas uh, people are talking about before and um, probably the most radical one. So do you think the regime change is the only solution for the future China? Or probably, <laughs> I don't think uh, CCP can have any more creative or radical or right movement in the future. So. <laughs> do I think regime change is the only answer? Now you've really put me on the spot. <laughs> I mean, I think there is always this yearning for an enlightened leader, for someone who will come in and push reform and change from the inside. Yeah, actually, initially, when Xi Jinping was step, step up, like people assume he's a kind of creative leader onto something more, um, free, more freedom in the China. His, his father was kind of a right wing. Um, so, do you think there is yet anything can come within the uh, Chinese Communist Party? That because there are a lot of conflict inside the party right now. We can see it from the pro corruption campaign. You know. 
I mean, it, it, this is the huge question, you know, what is happening inside the party now and what has happened to those forces that uh, might favour more reform. And I mean, when I was writing my book, I interviewed Bao Tong, who used to be uh, Zhao Ziyang's secretary. He was secretary of the Politburo Standing Committee. He was the highest member of government um, to go to prison after the Tiananmen crackdown. He spent seven years under house arrest and I asked him this question and um, his answer was quite depressing. He said that in his view, all the uh, more liberal party members in positions of power had been bought. Um, they'd been, uh, and that their family, either they or their family members had been bought by the kind of lure of wealth and the possibility of using their position. Now, I mean, sadly, when we look at Panama Papers, now we're seeing that all kinds of, you know, uh, the, the relatives of all kinds of officials are now kind of coming out of the woodwork, including Hu Yabang's relatives. So uh, it, this is a problem, and this is why the corruption campaign, uh, the anti-corruption campaign can have all kinds of other political motives going on because it, hollowing out a, a wing of the party. So I don't know if there are other, um, if there are any other so solutions apart from regime change, you know, that I think for many years, we in the West have liked to think, oh, well, China's going the right way. It's only a question of time that economic liberalization will inexorably lead to political liberalization, but that hasn't happened yet. Repeated pattern happen all the time in China, you know, from cultural revolution to nowadays. Like they want to do something, but finally someone step up and just step stop down, down this kind of uh, liberalization movement. Although there have been uh, periods where there's been more liberalization, and I, um, but unfortunately we're not seeing that now, and there are no signs that that will happen in the future. So I'm sorry to end on such a depressing note, <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Yeah.